So I'm working on a side project and I wrote a bunch of like prototype code and I want to kind of share with you all like what a good example of bad code is. I know when I first started off, it's kind of hard to know like what is good quality code, what is bad quality code, where do you draw that line and how do you actually improve the code that you're writing so that you can come back later and actually be thoroughly impressed with what you've written. But before we dive into sharing the code that I've written, I want you to make sure you click that subscribe button and bell icon because I'm going to have more videos like this in the future that should hopefully help you become a better web developer. And like always, give my video a thumbs up because it helps my channel grow. So let's just kind of dive right into it. So I have a project I'm working on where I'm basically trying to build a system for minting out a bunch of NFTs. Uh, if you don't really believe in Web3 NFTs, it doesn't really matter because this tutorial or this video will actually help you understand how to write cleaner code as I kind of walk you through what I've written and explain to you why you can do this better. So let's just go ahead and jump into the code and kind of see what I'm talking about here. All right, so first thing, looking at this code, I have a file called contractor. And what this code does is it basically allows people to create a contract on Polygon. Um, all that stuff you don't really need to know about, but what I'm trying to kind of explain is why this code is kind of bad. So if you look through this code, I do want to say that it's not necessarily bad in terms of formatting because I do run this through Prettier and I do also run this through ESLint. So the code is formatted and it's nice and like indented properly and it has semicolons everywhere and everything like that. But the real reason this code is kind of dirty is because first of all, if you look at this line or this file, it's about 226 lines of code, right? This is a red flag. If your files are getting over like a hundred something lines, Maybe there's a way that you can clean it up and make it more easy to understand and digest. Because remember, you need to come back later and understand what's going on here. So that's the first red flag is that this file is too large and you should really try to figure out a way to reduce the file size, maybe by splitting up the main function into smaller subcomponents and moving those out into other helper files. So let's just go ahead and read through this. First of all, this file has a public exported method called handler. So if you look here, we have the handler. And as you start reading through this code, like to understand what's going on, you have to actually understand the implementation details of some stuff. Like for an example, what's happening here while well, we're setting up a Web3 wallet? Is this really necessary to understand for the business logic? I don't know, but it probably could be pulled out into another function and abstracted away so that as reading through this code, you don't need to understand like what, it, what a HD wallet provider is and stuff like that. And then further down, we have a for loop. Again, usually when you have a for loop that has a ton of stuff in it, like if you kind of expand this, you see that this for loop is basically the entire function. So you could probably take the entire contents of this for loop and move it into a separate helper function called like process record or something, right? And so in here, you just basically map over the records and then call your callback function. That would make this method shorter and easier to kind of digest because now you kind of split out the logic to process on a single record and it's easier to understand the code base that way. So scrolling down a little bit further, you see that I'm doing like doc client dot git. All this stuff is dynamo DB calls, right? So I'm interacting with a database directly in my business logic, which is kind of another red flag. You should clean that stuff up and pull that into helper functions. Usually I put that in something called like a persistence folder. So you can see here, I do have a persistence folder. I'm gonna show you how you can use that coming up when I show you the clean code. But stuff like this, like if you were, for an example, using MySQL, you don't want SQL statements directly in your business logic. You wanna split that out into a separate function so that down the road, if you decide you don't wanna use SQL and you wanna use something else, well, your SQL statements aren't spread out through all your business logic. Instead, they're centralized in a different layer of your code base. And then of course I have like random console logs all through here, which you should probably use an actual logger. Like there's something called Winston, I believe, where you can actually set log levels. And these could probably be info levels instead of just console.log so that you can come through, you can change the log levels to either info, warning, error, or something like that. So it allows you to kind of get more information as you change the level up or down for debugging your application. But it's really important to have logs when you deploy stuff to production because that's the only insight that you get when your application starts failing. So I'm not saying that the logging is bad. It's good to have logging, but this is like prototypes. I just log out whatever I can to kind of help debug, but make sure you go back through, you add a real logger and you make sure that that logger supports log levels. And again, here we just have like random like database calls here. And it's really, really a lot of dirty code, honestly. So, and then finally there's like another for loop. So we had a main for loop and then nested inside that for loop is another for loop, which it could just be abstracted into helper functions. So this is kind of bad code. And I wanna show you another file that I have that's more elegant. 
because I've actually like invested more time in it. This code was like a prototype that I haven't gone back to add unit tests. And I haven't gone back to actually refactor. So let's look at a different file that is clean. Okay. So here's another file called IPFS.js. And this function is basically responsible for taking files and uploading to an IPFS node that's hosted on like another server that I have somewhere. So if you read through this one as an outsider, let's try to find the entry point. So we have module that exports that handler. So off the bat, I kind of did what I explained before in the other file where you, if you have a large for loop, you should kind of break out the inner block of the for loop and put that in a helper function. So now I loop over all the records and I call process record for each one. Okay. So let's go ahead and dive into that and let's read through what process record is doing. So first of all, it just takes some properties out of the payload that comes in in the record. And then we start calling some methods. So all of these methods like upload minted file, those are abstracting away the underlying persistence layer, right? So you don't know what this file is really, what this function is really doing, but you can read it and kind of understand what happens, right? So if I give it a file key, I'm going to get back an image buffer. So behind the scenes, this is just hitting S3 and fetching a file. But you see how I kind of abstracted that away. You don't really know where that file is coming from. It could be hosted on a different CDN. It could be hosted locally on my laptop, but it's abstracted away because the business logic doesn't need to care about it. So that is a function that I put into a persistence folder here called get unminted file. And you can kind of read through this code because it's really declarative. It just makes more sense. It reads more like a book. So we get the unminted file and then we upload a file to IPFS. That makes sense. That makes perfect sense, right? And then some of this could have been abstracted more like this whole replace logic. I probably could have made that into a helper function and called it, but some things are good to just have in your business logic. It's fine. So right, then we call get unminted file again. And this time we're passing in a metadata key. So we're getting a different file from S3 or the data store, wherever this happens to live. And we're doing some stuff on it, right? So then we kind of like stringify it and then we parse it. And then we get the image property and we replace it with a new hash. And then we call a method called upload file to IPFS, right? The same method, it makes it really clear what's happening here. And then finally we update the NFT entries hashes. So behind the scenes, this is just updating that DynamoDB record. But again, in your business logic, you don't care about DynamoDB. This could be writing to SQL. This could be writing to SQLite. This could be writing to like a local text file if you wanted it to. You don't really care and your business logic shouldn't care about it. So you can kind of see the steps kind of like go, go through one by one and it just makes more sense. And there's not a bunch of extra code that kind of makes it really confusing or overwhelming to read. So if you just kind of go through this, okay, we delete some unminted files. That's just deleting it from our file store. And then we send an unminted event which is basically just sending off an SQS message so that the next step of the process can start processing on this um, contract we're trying to create and the NFTs we're trying to mint. And then finally, we delete the original IPFS event. There's still a lot of stuff I could probably do to clean this whole file up. But another thing you'll notice is that this is only like 80 lines of code. This is doing a lot of logic. We're downloading files, we're modifying files, we're uploading files, we're creating uh, DynamoDB entries. But you don't really need to know about all that because it's all abstracted away into helper functions. And then to further exemplify how this code is much cleaner, I have an entire test suite around it, right? So I have Jest that's running all these different tests over that code so that I can simply load up my terminal, run this test file and verify that my code does exactly what we want it to do. So that's another thing that, I mean, it's huge into software engineering, just test your files, test your business logic, test your application. and it turns out if you can write tests, you can actually go and take dirty code and clean it up. That's kind of what I did. So before this IPF file was really dirty and it kind of had the same format as the contractor where we had just like file calls everywhere and just DynamoDB calls everywhere. But what I did was I started writing out a test and using test driven development, I started just writing out a first it statement saying like I should download a file from somewhere. And then I implemented the test case. And then I went back to the code and I started implementing the logic to make that test case pass. So that's all I really wanted to share with you in this video. If you guys enjoyed watching this and you kind of learned something about how to make your code a little bit cleaner and maybe saw a good example of how some code could look dirty just based on like how you have your function call set up and what your code is doing inside your functions, give me a thumbs up. Also, be sure to click that subscribe button and bell icon if you want more videos like this in the future because I can help you become a better web developer, hopefully. And like always, if you have a way that you like keeping your kind of functions small and keeping them abstracted away 
Maybe you like to follow the clean architecture book or the things that are kind of outlined in clean architecture. I'm kind of curious to hear how you keep your code clean and how you prevent it from becoming really messy. All right, thanks for watching and happy coding.